Welcome to our fourth BSUG of the year. Um, I won't spend too much time. Pardon? Oh, sorry. I've got the camera back there. Okay. Um, fourth uh, BSUG of the year. Um, I won't spend a lot of time introducing this because it's a uh, a project that has been developed here in the lab um, through support from Idaho Power. Um, I think it is a tool that I hope uh, uh, those of you who are here in the room and, and online uh, will uh, take uh, take a look at. We have it available on our website. Uh, it's it should be um, and we want it to be a tool that is really accessible to um, designers uh, of all types. Um, architects, uh, engineers, um, residential designers, contractors. So, so we think that this, this has a, a lot of potential to be a really useful tool to a broad audience. Um, so uh, Damon Woods is a, a PhD candidate here uh, in, in the lab who's going to uh, talk about this. He's been one of the people, uh, one of many, who have touched this project over the past few years. Um, but recently has, has taken it um, on to do some uh, testing with local uh, mechanical engineers and, and contractors to, to sort of get this beta version out um, and maybe start getting it to a, a fully functional tool that's, that's ready for sort of mass, uh, mass uh, use. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to, to Damon, and, and uh, I'm sure he'll say a... Um, Inter interrupt them at any time. If you have yeah, yeah. Feel free. Um, and if you're online, um, you're probably muted. So just type in questions, and we've got Dylan monitoring things in the back, and he'll be able to uh, interrupt me and um, read out any questions that that come through, so I can answer those. Um, so this is, um, as as Elizabeth said, a, a collaborative effort. You know, it's funded. Uh, through Idaho Power, so thanks for their support. Um, this is the brainchild of, of a few different people. Um, I, it owes a lot, especially to Katie Licklider. Um, Ari Gennady helped on this as well. Uh, several others throughout the years at IDL, Lauren and Gunnar um, and Jake. Uh, and there have been a couple different generations where we've really tried to push for passive design or design alternatives uh, through kind of a simple loads-based approach. And um, these ended up as different tools, these climate design tools, which you can go to our website and I'll show you where in a bit. Uh, and then we've kind of compiled them all into this one massive spreadsheet to end all spreadsheets, if you will, um, that we're calling kind of the, the test tool, the thermal energy savings tabulation, basically big Excel to look at three main things which you often get out of energy simulations. You know, you want to look at loads of your structure, you want to look at the energy required to meet those loads, and then the cost required to meet that energy. And so those are kind of the three different steps within the tool. Today I'll be focusing mostly on how we've integrated the climate design resources into it. Um, so this is still a beta tool. Um, we're looking for more feedback. If you'd like to use it, um, send us an email and we can, we can send you a test version for you and you can give us input. We've had some feedback this year. It's been really valuable for us. Um, since we host a lot of lectures, just wanted to let you know, you know who we are. You probably already do. Um, uh, the Integrated Design Lab, we're part of the University of Idaho. It's been fun being a student here and we really want to push the envelope on high performance design. We also get to work with Idaho Power on a lot of foundational services, um, their, their program in terms of design assistance. So that's for uh, businesses, clients within the Idaho Power service territory. So maybe not applicable for everybody out there online, uh, but for those uh, in the Idaho area, um, you know, give us a phone call. If it's just a little bit of our time, we, we'd love to help you out on that. The goal is to kind of bring your firm up to whatever capabilities you're looking for, whether that be daylighting or even using tools like this so we can um, help on some of that. We also have our building metrics labeling tool online, 
which is really fun, apples to apples comparison. It goes beyond the Energy Star score. Uh, it also looks at EUI and walkability score. Uh, so that, that resource is available online, which you can hand out to, to clients or something to kind of promote efficiency. As well as our massive online, well, um, tool loan library, which you can get to online. We check them out here. Uh, lots of, you know, infrared cameras and CO2 monitors, uh, sound monitors, flow meters, those get checked out a lot. Uh, tons of hobo loggers, so you can look at temperatures throughout the building. Uh, we use these a lot for commissioning, um, verifying, they're, they're great. So today, um, the climate design tools, it's, you can look at all the numbers that you want, but it's really the picture that speaks best to clients, to um, contractors of why should we push for, say, passive cooling or cross ventilation. Uh, this is what this tool is designed for. It's quick design, what ifs, and then putting out a nice graphic showing you kind of the benefits or maybe costs of implementing one of these things. So since it's all about spreadsheets, and spreadsheets have a terrible reputation, you know, they're from accountants. Accountants have a bad reputation. You're, you're just sitting in a cubicle. It's really boring. But well, maybe this speaks to my own nerdiness. I, I love them. Um, and I listened to a fascinating podcast uh, from Planet Money, and it was on the first spreadsheet that came out, which was in 1979. So this was prior to Excel, VisiCalc. Uh, and it was started by Dan Bricklin, who is uh, an economics student sitting in Harvard getting really bored because his professor had a giant blackboard with all of these little grids and their formulas in each grid. Uh, and as he's going through, looking at maybe uh, profit margins, things like that, he realizes, I've made a mistake. As he has to go back and erase all the way back to the beginning. And, you know, he thought, well, there's got to be a better way. So let's have these cells that have these formulas built into them. So that way, if you make a mistake, you can go back to the beginning. You don't have to erase and, and redo everything. And a lot of accounting firms they would have, you know, these literal spreadsheets and big desks, and a lot of bookkeepers, that was their full-time job, was just sitting there copying from one formula to the other. Maybe I'm just too young, but I really took this for granted um, until listening to that podcast. And as soon as automated spreadsheets came out, a lot of those bookkeeping jobs went way down, but that didn't necessarily impact the accounting business, because professional accountants, their client list rose a lot. Because all of a sudden, Hershey's could ask, well, what if we made our chocolate bar 4% smaller? I don't know why you'd want to make a smaller chocolate bar. But um, the idea of, OK, how much money would we save? And so you know, Dan Bricklin, he, the first guy to ever use this spreadsheet, he, he got a client who called him with a rush order. He's like, all right, I've got two days. I need to figure out what happens if I make this one change in my business. And so he said, sure. He did it in Excel in like two minutes. And then he sat back and had a burger and waited for two days. And then he emailed the, the guy saying, all right, here's the results. And he's like, oh, this is amazing. And now with competition, you can't really just sit back. But it does allow us to, within seconds, play these what if scenarios. Um, and that's you know, really the advantage of energy simulation. So we've got Energy Plus, And the goal here is to turn Energy Plus into a spreadsheet. So you can have these built-in calculations and do a quick, what if we added more glazing to the north side or added some to the south? How much is that going to increase our cooling load during the summer? Uh, so the, the capabilities of, of this tool, it's based on hourly calculations, similar to Excel, although Excel, you can also do time steps within that um, in, in Energy Plus. Um, but what it's, it's moving from is from this simple bin analysis where you've got maybe 10 or a few dozen different temperature bins and you're doing these calculations. Instead, it's a temperature bin for every single hour of the year. And so far more detailed than a typical bin analysis. Uh, 
verging on the, the details of Energy Plus. Um, it also provides energy savings estimations from passive design. I'll get into that with the, the climate design tools in there. And the whole sheet exists as a comparison tool. Um, you pick a baseline HVAC system uh, based on ASHRAE 90.1 kind of standards. So what if we've got a uh, package terminal heat pump versus a package VAV um, or a VRF system? Uh, so you've already already built in a, a baseline system that you can select and then a proposed system. And then you will see kind of your, your what if in terms of paybacks and energy consumption. It also gets into capital costs of the equipment based on RS means data as well as the energy cost estimates and from that you can get your life cycle cost analysis. So this the idea is to really replace a, a rule of thumb, oh, it's going to be about so many tons per square foot versus some hard numbers. You, you won't get the detail of Energy Plus, but it'll be a lot better than a guesstimation. So some highlights of the tool. It's really transparent. You can see each of the equations. Um, the, some of the cells might be kind of locked. You have to override them, but you can override them. Uh, there are a lot of defaults. The equations and the defaults are based on ASHRAE, um, ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals, uh, that lovely tome, which we can now check out out of our tool loan library. So if you don't have that, and, um, feel free to email us. Uh, we, for areas where uh, we we're looking at infiltration numbers, things like that, we kind of went beyond ASHRAE, looked at a few different peer-reviewed studies. All of those references are built into the tool. So if you're wondering, where is this equation coming from? Where is this reference coming from? It's all in one of the tabs. Um, the calculations allow for unique inputs. Uh, it's, it's simplified. It's a one zone model. So you're not going to have this 20 zones, really strange architecture. It's kind of assuming a box. Uh, but you can customize that to you know, the window to wall ratio, things like that specific to your project. The, the great thing is that it estimates loads almost immediately. So you don't have to wait for a long simulation run or anything like that. Because all the equations uh, are kind of pre-built in there, as soon as you change one number, you get the results immediately. So that's really nice. Um, and from there, based on the loads and the HVAC system that you select, these curves um, developed from Department of Energy and a lot of simulations in Energy Plus uh, for kind of part load and, uh, runs and things like that, we can estimate how much energy it's going to take to meet those loads based on the HVAC system you select. Uh, and then from there, look at a financial analysis. So the goal is as easy as possible while keeping it as accurate as can be given its granularity but keep it really, really flexible um, so that architects or engineers can go in and s really say, well, I don't like this particular design assumption. Let me change it to X or Y. Um, and use it to look at loads, systems, and really uh, one of the primary motivations was heat pumps and the way heat pumps and VRF systems are, are starting to be kind of a game changer financially in the terms of energy uh, for HVAC systems. Um, so there's a, a one input kind of page for this instead of jumping around from tool to tool. Uh, it's all kind of consolidated. There's an HVAC tab that I'll get to. Rather than showing a lot of static screenshots, which are, are tough to kind of talk through, I thought I'd go straight into the tool show how it's used um, on, a, on a typical case study. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. It, it does not. Um, we just added in uh, residential type and residential loads. Um, so that's, that's fairly new. Um, but you can put in as large of a building as you like. 
it's likely going to be less accurate the larger the building and the less zoning that you have because it assumes a, a single zone box. Uh, so this is a, <coughs> let me see if I can bring up, so here's how we would do it in Energy Plus, right? Um, a, a typical office building, uh, maybe it's from the 70s or so, looking at upgrading some of the systems. We can go in, we can look at each window, and this is <laughs> great. This gives us far more options in Energy Plus, but it's also very, very time intensive and you might not have that time or want to gain all of that expertise and hike up that learning curve that's required in Energy Plus. So um, thus the climate design tools and the test spreadsheet, the thermal energy savings tabulation. So we select our location. Right now um, we have pretty much every major geographic location in Idaho. Um, so we could go to Pocatello if we want, and immediately it updates the weather file that we're using. I'm going to stay in Boise for right now. Um, however, if you're outside of Idaho, there are instructions on the weather tab. So you can go in and paste in that TMY, that typical meteorological year file. And that's got wind and rain and daylight all for each hour of the year. You can see, paste that in. And that's what all the you know, equations are based on. Because with the loads, we've got the climate, and then we've got the structure. And it's how the two interact. So in terms of the structure, we need to know how it's going to be used. So we have a few different building types in here. We've got school. I think we've even got college dorms, um, hotel, and residence. Uh, for now, I'm going to stick with office. But as you update each of these, it's going to change over here. You're hours of operation. Um, so schools, they have a lower summer use. Uh, they close earlier than an office building. Um, you know, but that's something that you don't have to put in by yourself. It automatically defaults to that. However, if you want to, once again, all about flexibility, uh, what if you wanted to do a custom schedule? What if you've got an office where the employees are slaving away 24-7, um, then you can go in uh, and these little orange cells automatically link through the document because it's a really big Excel tab. So it's nice being able to fly from one end to the other. Um, and you can say, you know what, instead of a default, I do want a custom schedule. And then you can go and build it. And you can look at occupancy. You can look at um, lighting and equipment and change all of these uh, depend down to the very day if you want. I'll leave that as default for now. Um, we also put in kind of the um, default occupied heating and cooling set points as well as setbacks. Once again, you can change those if you like. And then the, the building details. So instead of designing that all in SketchUp, you're looking at just kind of the shell. You want to look at the total building area, square footage, uh, the floor to floor height, and then the perimeter. So, you know, this building is four stories, so the perimeter is, you know, much smaller than a single story, 23,000 square foot building. And then we have our design day temps. And you'll see these little yellow things popping up, and you can see um, where these defaults are coming from, which is awfully nice. So cooling design day temp and heating design day temp, those are coming from kind of the ASHRAE 0.4% conditions or 99.6% or conditions for your peak heating and cooling, which are great, especially if you're looking at a VAV system, but maybe not so great if you're looking at a heat pump, right, where you don't want the heat pump to be sized for the worst case scenario. You want it to be sized for maybe a 30 degree outside air temperature, and then you've got some supplemental heating that you're going to add on to that. Um, so if you're sizing your heat pump for that type of system, you know you might need to add in extra energy for that supplemental. Um, but if you want to get a general sense of the loads that it's going to meet, how much you're leaving out, 
this is a great way to do it is by uh, adjusting these design day temperatures. Um, if you do select a residence, you can select how many bedrooms it has. That automatically updates the number of people in the house, all the different loads that are going to be in there. Let me see here. Um, and then the envelope. So we're kind of assuming a, a box. Um, and we need to know the total area of each of the walls and the amount of windows on each of those. So you can get that from your drawings, from your Revit model, uh, without having to go all the way into Energy Plus or anything like that. And then you can look at, this is where you can start playing with your what-if values. So we have these defaults, and this default assumes steel-framed wall construction. And you say, well, I, I don't necessarily want that. You can go ahead and pop over here, and it links to ASHRAE 90.1-2007 values for um, you know, that table um, for the building envelope requirements uh, for that code. So that's great. So you can look at instead of a metal building, um, say a mass building or um, you know, whatever construction your heart desires. Or if you've got a custom one, you can put that in as well. Um, and then same as uh, for the construction class where you can pop back and forth to the representative constructions. Um, and what that does is it helps influence the radiant time series method that's in there. So you've got sun shining on your building. That heat isn't going to go into your air immediately. There's going to be some sort of delay. And that delay is going to be based on you know, the density of the structure. Um, you know, if it's going to be thick concrete versus thin wood, it's going to have a different amount of time that it takes that surface to heat up and then for there to be a temperature difference between that wall and the indoor air temperature and then you get convection and then it raises the temperature. So this accounts for that delay. That's part of that radiant time series method. It's the same method that Doe 2 uses um, and is used in eQuest. Energy Plus, it gets down to the nitty gritty, the actual like Stefan Boltzmann's law, which is awesome, but that is very complicated and requires a lot of simulation time. This does not. Um, your roof, if you've got different roof slopes, that's auto saves. Sorry. Um, and then you can get into your internal heat gains. So people, lights, um, infiltration, and your tightness. And so you can see really quickly. Um, so our balance point right now, based on this, is estimated at 56 degrees. But what if we tightened up that envelope quite a bit? Instead of this leaky, um, we had a code baseline building. That's going to drop our balance point a lot lower. The building's able to retain more heat. Um, what if we had a really tight construction? It's going to drop it even lower. And so if you wanted to figure out, OK, where is that infiltration coming from? What standards? Uh, once again, jump on this hyperlink. It will take you back to the references tab, which is down here, um, our, our lookup tables and references. So all of this is just on the loads input. And as often as possible, um, there are these little callouts showing why the numbers are the way that they are um, and, and what you can do to influence that. So I want to move kind of past the inputs, but I can come back to these if you like, into the, the really fun stuff, I think, um, which is how we've integrated the, the passive cooling um, and climate design tool set into the spreadsheet. Uh, and a lot of thanks goes out to Amir Nezemdus, who recently helped us author a paper on using these climate design tools for an airplane hangar. Uh, and hopefully that will be coming out in uh, the Energy and Buildings um, journal soon. Um, uh, finishing off the, the reviewers' comments on that. And this is where all of those numbers, all that data crunching, that boring stuff gets translated into actionable, nice printouts. So for this building, um, you know, looking at the, the operation um, and the balance point, you can see, based on my climate, Boise, how much 
of the year is going to be spent in terms of heating, how much is going to be needed for cooling, and how many hours of the year, so each of these is kind of sliced into hours of the year, how many could be used for passive ventilation, where you're not necessarily incurring a heating penalty or a cooling penalty. So that's great. So once again, we can jump back and say, you know what, um, the, the building right now is pretty leaky, so the balance point is going to jump up here. We go back to our advanced time, and it raises it automatically for us. So it's kind of instant feedback, um, instant visual feedback, so you can have that kind of gut instinct on, well, is this going to be a good thing for my building or not? Obviously, a higher balance point in, in Boise climate, we really have a, a lot of hours of heating. Um, and so it shows kind of the number of hours that you have the potential for using a passive ventilation strategy. And there's two ways we could go about that. We could use cross ventilation or stack ventilation. Both of these tools originally existed separately. Um, now you can see them all, all together. So this is, I think we've got uh, a nice little um, poster on the back on natural ventilation um, with some kind of better graphics showing this, but assuming this crowd knows that cross ventilation, you're trying to just open up windows and just have this nice kind of cross breeze flowing through your building. One of the really fun things, I think, is the uh, windrows that, that updates depending on your climate. So if we were to change our climate from Boise and say, actually, instead of building in Boise, we're going to be in um, Twin Falls. Uh, let me see. Should we all try Lewiston? That might show up a little bit better. Very different wind profile in Lewiston than in Boise. Um, and we can dial down into the individual month. So say we want to maximize cross ventilation during that nice kind of May, June, spring that we have. Um, you can see it update instantly, as well as the annual wind speeds. OK, I'm going to change this back to Boise, because it's got a nice kind of even profile that we can work with. and look at the overall year. So what this says pretty quickly is if you do want to use cross ventilation as a primary design strategy, um, make sure your windows are opening kind of on the northwest and the southeast corners of the building. Um, it's not going to be flowing quite as nicely north to south or certainly not northeast to southwest. So uh, it also updates the number of hours that you can have cross ventilation. And <coughs> importantly, especially if these are going to be operable windows and not automatic, the number of hours that are going to be occurring during when your building is supposed to be occupied. So that's about 4% of the time, looks like. And immediately it will show you your cooling load reduction, which is great in terms of KB to use. So this means you get to downsize your equipment by this many BTUs based on implementing a, a cross ventilation strategy. All right, the same is true for the stack ventilation spreadsheet on here. Um, so you have to put in your kind of working area uh, in terms of the tube that you're actually going to be using, whether that be an elevator shaft or some other chimney that you're designing into your structure, uh, as well as the height, the discharge coefficient uh, that's coming from an ASHRAE default. Uh, and once again, all of the defaults coming from these lookup tables. So just pop into that tab if you need to. And based on, instead of you having to calculate bin analysis, buoyancy, temperature differentials, all of that is already done for you. Um, 
and you can see the number of hours during occupied time and the potential cooling load reduction that would come from a stack ventilation. Now the, the stack ventilation, the cross ventilation, these exist separately because you know stack works well when the air is kind of still outside, doesn't work well with you know great high winds shooting across your building, but that's perfect for cross ventilation. Um, so you know based on your climate, you know looking at your annual wind speeds, which you can see very quickly here, um, you can decide well, you know what. Uh, cross ventilation is going to give me far more cooling than my stack ventilation strategy, so I'm going to design my building around that. Instead of designing around a central chimney, I'm going to design more with kind of windows along a certain axis that are going to be operable, either automated or um, people people doing that themselves, uh, or or maybe a mix of the two, kind of like the Bullet Center um, in Seattle. Although I think most of those are are all automated. Uh, and then a quick glance at, you know, hours in the year and the cooling load. Um, if you did want to combine the cross and the stack, how much of an impact is that going to have uh, versus just the stack or just the cross ventilation? So quick visual feeling um, that, that it gives you. Instead of this rule of thumb of it'll probably work, um, you know, this, this might be a light bulb of, hey, cross ventilation is going to work really well, stack ventilation not so much, I'm going to go, I'm going to pursue that design further. So this is not the be all and end all of your design. This is just answering kind of the, the what if and then keying you into, okay, maybe I should do further simulations or further calculations uh, on this particular strategy. Um, night flush ventilation. Um, so the idea of you know opening up or just having fans kind of running through the, the slab at night to cool down your thermal mass, you know it's it's great in an environment like Boise where we've got this big diurnal swing of you know 20 to 30 degrees between daytime and nighttime. Not so good maybe for like New Orleans or something like that uh, where it stays kind of hot and humid and doesn't drop by that much during the summertime. So I'm very grateful to be living in Boise, I'll just say that, because um, I like to leave my windows open at night, at, at least at my house. But for a, an office, you could say, okay, well, how much is that going to then downsize my cooling equipment that I'm going to need if I implement this strategy? So you put in your floor area, and like I said, all of these cells, you can see where it's coming from. You can track it down. Uh, it's very transparent and very flexible. That does come with a danger. It comes with a danger of if you edit things and you don't keep track of that or you change a reference, um, then you know it's, it's not going to auto-update if you hard size something for the next time that you do an iteration. So I always like to keep one spreadsheet when I'm a, whenever I'm working on a project using this. I keep one spreadsheet with all of the defaults in there, and then I do one where I start changing my own numbers, but I can always come back to the defaults. That way I make sure I'm not deleting any of my cross-cell references or anything like that. Um, but it's flexible, it's open, you can do that, and, and it's kind of designed for you to do that, as so long as you, you're taking it on at your own risk. I'll just say that. Um, but it's, it's a good risk to take. Uh, zone volume, automatically calculated for this. And then, um, you know, these, these densities, these mass capacities, they're not coming out of thin air, that you're not just guessing on them. You can look in the ASHRAE table, but instead of taking your book and looking at the index, and paging through it, we've got it automatically hyperlinked in here. So this can, this can be a big time saver. Um, even just for this, even if you're not looking at the HVAC stuff, um, looking at all of these references for, for ventilation, having them all in one spot and indexes is, is really nice. Um, and then we can see the number of hours that we would have with our potential for night flush and the cooling load reductions that we could actually have by implementing this strategy. So 565 hours, 6% of the year, we could get by um, with using a, a night flush strategy, which is great. 
and this is with a fairly high balance point. So we can make a change again. Of, uh, let's go back and change this front to a tight structure. So what does that mean? It means it keeps the heat in a little bit better. We've got a much lower balance point. Then how does that affect our night flush? Um, well, because we've lowered our, our balance point, we need more cooling in the building. Night flush is even more effective. This is not an encouragement to leave really leaky buildings or anything like that. Um, but it's nice to be able to play around with the balance point temperature um, pretty quickly and see what effect that has, whether you're designing for a very tight envelope or you can change your, um, you know, the balance point is influenced by a number of issues, um, you know, the, the amount of glazing that you have, um, the internal loads, uh, uh, etc. And so while we've put in these kind of loads inputs, it is a massive spreadsheet. It's like 30 something megabytes. So it does take a, a minute to kind of transfer from each to the other. But I'm, I'm happy to sacrifice a couple seconds without having to go through the full energy plus thing on the, on the front end or wait for a long simulation time. But our, our loads results are automatically existing in this tab. So we will see our peak heating load, our peak cooling load, as well as what is that balance point? Where is that coming from? Um, and you can see the, um, here's the average outdoor air temperature. Here's our load uh, for heating or for cooling. And you can see that's, we're, we're looking for the bottom of that V, if you will. Um, and that's where our balance point temperature is coming from. And that is shown on this, um, I think down at the bottom here, but um, I often refer to it here just in that simple balance point on, a, on the very first loads input page. Okay, so knowing the balance point, knowing the heating versus the cooling loads, looking at the advantages of using night flush ventilation, all that updates really quickly. In addition to having the actual numbers in terms of load reductions, uh, and the hours in the year when this is a viable strategy. If it's only happening 2% of the year, maybe it's not ideal to implement that strategy. Um, but here it's, it's looking like it is. And if you have a client or a controls engineer who's skeptical, um, this picture tells a thousand words. It shows uh, when during the summertime it could be useful. Uh, looking at the average temperature and your cooling load. Uh, and you can even look at a particular day. So we've got a design day, looking at the mass storage capacity. So when it's going to be in cooling mode, how much energy can we kind of pull out of that thermal mass or, or store cool in it, basically. Um, and, and look at that, that daily um, sensible cooling rate and potential cooling that we can save packed inside that cement. And so this goes back to the kind of the design question of should I design for a high thermal mass or kind of a low thermal mass construction if I'm going to be using night flush? Well, it's going to depend on if you're building in Haley or building in Boise, um, where you might be fighting, you know, if, if you're in Haley or a really cold climate, it's going to be a lot of energy um, all winter long trying to keep that warm and you're not going to get a big advantage of kind of the cooling during the summer whereas Boise, pretty hot summers, pretty big temperature swing, this is probably a good way to go. But instead of just thinking about it or um, saying, yeah, that, that feels good, um, this will give you some data, some images to back up or maybe even contradict your, your feelings, your gut instincts, your rules of thumb. Uh, and, and provide a more substantial basis. Um, so all of these tabs, uh, all of these design strategies are, are in here, incorporated now, which are really fun to play with. And that's speaking of the loads. So that provides, you know, how much heating or cooling we're going to need in there. How are we then going to meet that? 
heating or cooling. Um, so we can go to our HVAC tab, and we have several different systems kind of built into here for both residential and commercial. And uh, these system types, um, they're, they're coming from ASHRAE 90.1. The tool currently, it's built on the 90.1-2007 code cycle. Uh, I, I hope as I continue to tinker with the tool and learn more, I'm still catching up to Katie's genius on this, um, but I hope to implement other codes that are in there as well, um, IECC and maybe different um, years of the, the 90.1 ASHRAE codes. Um, but for now, it's ASHRAE 90.1 2007, and we base our system selection on the baseline systems in that, as well as their, um, uh, pardon me, their custom, their efficiency. Um, so we can select baseline or high performance. And for now, I'm comparing kind of a, a water source heat pump system to a VRF. So let me just kind of back up and say, you know, where we've come from, what, what we actually had to do. I walked us through a whole bunch of different options, but if you've just got a simple, hey, I need to figure out um, basic loads, basic HVAC system I need to go with on this project. You just walk through your location, your use, the, the basic area, and where the windows are going to be on your building. Then you can hop right over to your HVAC tab and say, all right, should I go with a water source heat pump or should I go with kind of the, the VRF? And then look at the savings. And the savings are going to be in the energy cost results. Um, I'm going to scroll down to um, the, the one that usually gets the most attention is the cash flow um, and the payback period. So looking at this particular example, the VRF system is going to be more expensive than the water source heat pump. Um, and it looks like it is not going to pay itself back. So maybe I should, uh, but you might not be starting with the water source heat pump. Maybe your building has like an old VAV system. And so you're comparing an upgrade of should I just replace my VRF with a new VAV? Um, or replace my old VAV with a new one? Or should I upgrade to a VRF? Well, you can look at your energy cost results tab. Scroll down um, and see. Okay, earlier I set up this test case and it did pay itself back. So now I'm making VRFs look bad and I feel bad about that. I'm sorry to all the, the, the VRFs out there. Um, let me see. High performance, baseline performance. Maybe I was looking at package VAV. Uh, um, I didn't, but I might have been looking at... Um, Instead of a tight construction, I might have been looking at uh, a baseline or a leaky building because that's the, the building project that I was actually using at the beginning. So, and it does. There we are. Mm -hmm. that's, that was, that was the, the key there. So a nice, interesting finding I didn't expect. I started with, you know, uh, if you don't actually... Um, address the, the envelope in terms of the leakiness of it, the infiltration, then that's really going to affect your HVAC system selection. Um, so for this particular example, we've got uh, a higher capital cost, um, but we put in here um, kind of rates, and these you can override as well for, depending on where you are, your dollars per therm, your dollars per kilowatt hour, and then look at the annual dollars that you're saving um, in terms of energy. Well, I, it would be great if everybody just looked at whatever saved the most energy. Um, we live in a capitalist society. I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm happy capitalist. But, you know, money really speaks. And so um, 
the imp incremental first cost, you can look at your proposed system. It's going to be a $2.20 premium over a VAV system. Um, and so you're, you're going to be paying initially more, but over the lifetime of building, um, you know, it'll provide a simple payback in 11 years. Uh, if you want to change, so these numbers are coming from the uh, cost uh, tab. Let me see exactly where we got that before. And you can, the nice thing is that you can look exactly at where these are coming from. There's your cost per square foot from the proposed system versus the baseline. Uh, these are for just the equipment. That's, that's some of the feedback we've had on uh, this tool. We need to make the, the cost data a little bit more transparent um, because this is, is not including like the full design work. Um, it's, it's looking at just the heating and the cooling equipment plus the, the zonal equipment based on this RS means 2012 estimate. So if you're talking with a contractor and they're giving you a cost per square foot um, you know, cost for a baseline, say, say you ask, okay, I want a VAB versus a VRF, uh, you can override these defaults and put in your exact cost per square foot and then look at the incremental first costs and then your payback period for your actual design. Um, so with that, I think I've just got a few uh, minutes left. Um, there's so much to show in this tool. It's, it's really, um, it's been really fun to play with. I know a few people that have picked this up just for their own houses um, to look at whether like a heat pump would be better than installing like a gas furnace or something like that. Um, I didn't really get into the residential side of things, but that's available. Um, I've certainly enjoyed playing with that. Um, but uh, I, I want to leave it open to people who are online or, or you guys here in the room um, if there's something else you would like to see in particular. And then if you did want to just stick with, say, okay, maybe this is too much, you can stick with the individual climate design tools that we have. Um, if you just go to our, our webpage, IDL, and then click on design tools, um, we've got the, the climate design resources, the first and kind of second generation tool sets. And that shows kind of cross-ventilation, stack ventilation. The thing is to use any of these tools when they exist separately, they, they need to know the loads of the building um, so it, it, you, you're stepping back into all of those individual inputs. The idea of putting them all together in this kind of thermal energy savings tabulator is to um, have one input stream so you don't have to go back through and um, spend a lot of tedious time re-entering in that peak heating or peak cooling load that you're trying to meet. But um, yeah, these, these also exist individually and you can go ahead and um, download them. I think you have to log in or, or register on the site, but once you do, you can download these Excel tools. And those are a little bit lighter, um, like the EarthTube one, um, but like I said, you have to step through each tab, whereas this has it all kind of combined in one. Have you looked into, as a potential solution, like the Earth 
Um, there's passive solar um, that's that's built into this a little bit. Um, to be honest, I haven't played with that as much, so um, but I can I can get back to you on that. Um, you know how to how to you, how to implement that in the tool. But it does include all of the information for that um, because it looks at the actual latitude and longitude, the solar declination angles, all and irradiance, all of that is in there. So. It's really good for, for designing architects. It can be used as a design tool to help get you with determining that. If, if you're interested in, you know, passive design, and you can work through this pretty quickly a shoebox kind of model and get a sense of, you know, where do I want this on the site? What, where do I want my openings? For, whether that's for, for uh, passive solar or for uh, cross ventilation and those sorts of things. You start making some, some design decisions based Yeah, and, and right away, you know, you can go in and change um, your window to wall ratio, say on like the south facade or something like that, change your construction from um, light to heavy, um, and immediately see how that impacts your heat balance um, and your heating and cooling loads, um, especially during the winter. Yep. I, I recommend everyone to start with their own house. Go on to the first house. Yeah, really, the inputs only take a few minutes once you know the structure, if that. I mean, it's just, it's really quick. The thing is, it, it goes so deep, like all of the equations are back there. She can get really lost in the rabbit hole if you want, or you can just kind of skip along the surface. Um, so it, it's nice, it's flexible, which is great. Um, I, I think so. I think that's the plan. Um, I actually had a slide on, on other things that we're going to try and uh, potential next steps. Um, have more custom systems and equipments rather than those, those defaults. Um, update some of the cost uh, data and code cycles on there. Um, possibly multi-zone capability was, it was something Katie was interested in before she took off. Um, and, and make it more uh, amenable to iterative analysis. Right now it's great for kind of like one at a time, but it'd be nice to see comparisons stacked against each other um, the way that the HVAC systems are right now. So. You kind of have to do your own iteration. Yeah, you have to kind of do your own iteration. So once you put all of your information in, can you save that? Yes. Yep. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You can really mess this up. It's open. So I would recommend saving a version file and then going in. And <laughs> so you can always return that because like, you see, yeah. you could mess. There's, there's not a lot of locked stuff. So there's warnings, though, in here. When you cover over some of the cells, it will say, basically, are you sure you want to? <laughs> this is, it might be something you won't want to change, but. Yeah, in the past, we've had it, a lot of it was locked up, but it's been kind of loosened over time. I think that's just because we've been playing with it so much. Um, but we might, I don't know, depends on user feedback. If you find that you're too worried about, Messing things up, then we can you know lock things back to back to a lot of the defaults as well. So, and then you can just kind of go and say yes, I'm definitely sure I want to override this. But, but for now, it's it's very flexible. It's, it's very open. Yeah. 